The River Kwai runs through one of Thailand's most fertile areas, land bursting with sugarcane and rice. But it is also the site of some of World War II's worst atrocities. A movie starring William Holden made the River Kwai a household name. Japanese soldiers forced slave laborers and allied prisoners of war to build a railroad there under the threat of torture and death. You'll hear from the men who worked on that railway, who were frequently beaten, but whose spirits were never defeated. The acclaimed movie Bridge on the River Kwai introduced audiences to one of World War II's greatest events, the building of the Thailand-Burma Railway. But the film was more Hollywood than history. In the true story, Allied prisoners were tortured and starved as they struggled to build far more than a bridge. They would hack a 250-mile railroad out of some of the harshest jungle on Earth. Thousands of these men would never return from the horror of building a railway of death. The river is not called the Kwai in Thailand, but rather the Kwai. The Kwai Noi, to be exact, meaning the small tributary. This meandering tropical stream drains the rain-soaked mountains which border Myanmar, once known to the world as Burma. Everywhere one looks, nature's force is vibrant and diverse. From towering stands of bamboo and teak to the tiniest of the forest's creatures. The stunning beauty of this natural world is irresistible. It has about it the charms of serenity and innocence that a hectic world longs for. But almost 60 years ago, this forest, this river, lost their charm. Beauty gave way to unspeakable cruelty. Where children now play, dying men once bathed their wounds. For it was here that thousands of American, British, Dutch and Australian prisoners struggled to survive the inhuman demands of the greatest engineering project of World War II. From their tortured memories, the prisoners created these drawings and paintings to remind the world of what they endured. They had come to paradise and found a hell called the Thailand-Burma Railway. It would consume the lives of over 100,000 men. Rod Beatty is an Australian in charge of the Allied cemeteries in Thailand. He is too young to have been here during the war, but his passionate interest in what happened here has led him to seek out and preserve what remains of the infamous railway. Standing here on what appears to be a pile of rocks, I am in fact standing on a remaining remnant of the Thailand-Burma Railway. In 1942-1943, the Japanese bought more than 60,000 Allied prisoners of war more than a quarter of a million Asian labourers into the jungles of Thailand and Burma to build this railway. Today, if you cut your way through the remaining vestiges of these jungles, you can still find traces of the Japanese ambitions of that time. Using bare hands and sweat, Allied prisoners of war built a railway of almost 250 miles. It would be the equivalent of a line from New York City to Washington, D.C. Only this one was hacked out of trackless wilderness. These men built over 600 bridges and viaducts, but sadly, most people have heard of only one. It is known to most as the bridge on the River Kwai, but the famous movie rewrote the history of the bridge with a host of inaccuracies. To begin with, it wasn't built of wood. We're here at Tamakan, outside of Kanchanaburi in Thailand, on the real bridge. And as you can see, it looks nothing like the bridge of movie fame. This bridge is built of steel and concrete. 
However, just downstream from here, about 100 yards, there was a wooden bridge, a temporary bridge to carry construction vehicles across the river while this more permanent and substantial bridge was completed. The bridge of movie fame was an impressive accomplishment, but it's only a small part of the story of the Thailand-Burma Railway. All along its course, Allied prisoners were tortured, starved and ravaged by a host of terrible diseases. But along with thousands of enslaved Asian labourers, they accomplished an engineering feat which some compare to the pyramids. It took only 14 months, but when it was finished, the Japanese had their railroad and thousands of innocents had perished in brutal, needless deaths. Deaths that more resembled murder than warfare. How could a sophisticated and sensitive culture produce an army which would indulge in such incredible cruelty? The Japanese soldier came out of a society steeped in a tradition which emphasized that loyalty was paramount. And the central object of that loyalty was a living god who, in 1926, was Emperor Hirohito. From the childhood, we are taught that the Emperor is our father, and the Empress is my mother. You were absolutely loyal to the Emperor, and you walked out of basic training and into the army with the ability not to question anything. When the Japanese private soldiers were asked to ban at helpless Chinese prisoners, they did it, unquestioningly. It was an order. When they were asked to beat prisoners, they did it unquestioningly. This was an order. The men who were shaping this new army demanded its soldiers follow the ancient code of Bushido, which was based on soldiers never being dishonored. And the most shameful dishonor was surrender. The Japanese soldier was trained in a harsh world of cruelty. Brutality became a way of life. Officers and NCOs routinely resorted to slappings, uh, fisticuffs, kickings, beatings for the smallest infraction. Recruits being knocked physically unconscious was part of their training, a routine part of the Japanese training. Indoctrinated to abhor surrender and trained in an atmosphere of casual and constant cruelty, Japanese soldiers were not conditioned to offer any compassion to prisoners under their control. In 1929, Japan elected not to ratify the Geneva Convention's guidelines for the treatment of prisoners of war. Japan's armies were now under no obligation to international law to offer prisoners any kindness. By the late 1930s, Japan's empire had grown. With each victory, so too grew her appetite for more. For all her conquests, Japan still believed it could not survive without acquiring resources to the south. Thailand and Burma were the great rice bowls of Southeast Asia. British Malaya was rich in rubber and tin, and Dutch East Indies possessed what Japan perhaps needed most, a plentiful supply of oil. To obtain these vital resources, by 1941, the ruling military government in Tokyo had decided on a two-part strategy. They would destroy the American fleet at Pearl Harbor and move to conquer the treasures of Southeast Asia and the Indies. The biggest obstacle to this last would be the British bastion on the tip of Malaya, Singapore. Singapore was the crown jewel of the British Empire in the Far East. The drowsy colony was the center of British commercial and financial dominance of the entire region. To protect British Malaya, Singapore was surrounded by powerful shore batteries of 9 and 15 inch guns. The secure harbor was home to the British Far East fleet. But the Japanese quickly grasped several reasons why the great fortress of Singapore was a paper tiger. The British had always been certain that no invading army could come through the jungle of the Malayan Peninsula. They had few plans to defend against land attack. And in 1940 and 41, most of the British Far Eastern fleet was far away helping England fight for its life against Hitler's Germany. Although they would be seriously outnumbered, the Japanese made a plan. They would indeed brave the jungle and attack Malaya from the north. 
speed would be the key. On December the 8th, 1941, the Japanese invaded Malaya. It was the opening attack of the Pacific War. Because of the international dateline, it was over an hour later before the Japanese struck at Pearl Harbor on December the 7th. The Japanese attack on Malaya was led by Lieutenant General Yamashita. The British Army was under the immediate command of Lieutenant General A.E. Percival. He was a man of quiet charm, but some felt he lacked the forcefulness to inspire the units under him. Percival had 85,000 British and Commonwealth troops to the Japanese 60,000. But numbers were not enough. Most of his command had virtually no combat experience. It was a problem the Japanese didn't share. What they were up against were a, really a tough, tough group of hardened infantry. These were tough veterans who had been at war a long time. The Japanese planning proved very successful. Within days, the British line was collapsing and the Japanese swarmed south. Remarkably, bicycles gave the infantry great speed. When the tires blew out, the soldiers became adept at riding on the rims. But it was more than bicycles that were winning this fight for the Japanese. Britain quickly lost control of the air. British planes were too few and too old to hold back Japanese fighters. There was an alternative to fighting in Singapore, and that was pulling out. But how do you pull out of a fortress that you've been telling the world was impregnable, that you were going to defend to the last? On the evening of February the 7th, Japanese troops landed on the island of Singapore. Eight days later, after fierce fighting, the unthinkable happened. General Percival led his staff towards the Japanese to surrender. We all sort of sat around, somewhat stunned. But when it, the hour came, it was, there was a deathly hush. And I think we looked at each other and wondered where the devil we were and what was happening. Well, we just couldn't believe it. I felt bloody dreadful. I felt as though the whole world had collapsed. The two sides met at the Ford car factory in Singapore. Percival tried to stall for time. Japanese General Yamashita would have none of it. He pounded the table and demanded that Percival tell him he agreed to surrender. It would be the greatest defeat in British history. Percival was stunned and could not speak. Finally, all he could do was sadly sign the agreement. In an instant, 130,000 men became prisoners of the Japanese. Singapore was now part of the Japanese Empire. The humiliation of this symbol of British colonialism was a source of great pride for the Japanese army. But the British and Commonwealth soldiers in Malaya were not the only troops to become prisoners in these early days of the war. In late February 1942, the Japanese invaded the Dutch East Indies. Nine days later, the Netherlands colonial army capitulated. The last message of the Dutch to the outside world was, we are shutting down, goodbye to better times, God save the Queen. Nearly 37,000 more men were added to the growing number of prisoners under Japanese control. Fred Seeker, had been in the Dutch Merchant Navy. And we thought it very wise to sort of turn ourselves in, which we did. And a Japanese officer came out and addressed me in perfect English. And he explained to me that the best thing I could do was to just shut up, be quiet, because I now was a prisoner of war of the Japanese Imperial Army. And as such, I had no rights whatsoever. In the early days of the war, other nations had sent forces to help the Dutch. Now, thousands of additional Australian and British troops were swept up on Java and Sumatra. America, too, had sent a token force to the Dutch. The 131st Field Artillery Regiment had been part of the Texas National Guard and had been ordered to Java in hopes of delaying the Japanese. <laughs> 
Their task was hopeless, and they were quickly captured. The heavy cruiser USS Houston had been in Manila when war broke out. It was immediately ordered to the Indies. Along with other Allied ships, the Houston had put up a valiant fight at the Battle of the Java Sea. But on March the 1st, in a night battle off the coast of Java, she was sunk with well over half her crew. The rest managed to abandon ship, only to be rounded up by the Japanese. This landing barge came alongside of me and pulled me out of the water. Otto Schwarz was a young seaman who would lose part of his eyesight in captivity. I got my first beating uh, almost immediately upon being thrown on the beach. I sat down on a wooden crate, and a, and a Japanese came around and started screaming at me and smacked me and knocked me off the box. And then, of course, it got progressively worse from there on. In just three months of war, the Japanese had acquired nearly 200,000 prisoners in Malaya and the East Indies. It was an embarrassingly large number of prisoners for the Japanese to deal with, and there is certainly evidence that they, at the start, really didn't have a clear notion of what they were going to do with them. Gradually, many prisoners in the Indies were taken to the Dutch capital of Batavia, present-day Jakarta. Allied prisoners in Singapore were taken to a large barracks complex known as Changi. It was a sad moment uh, when we were uh, lost our weapons, and uh, then when we were formed up to, uh, to march to Changi, uh, it was even, even worse. We were moving through areas where the civilian population uh, were very quiet. There was a lot of dead bodies about uh, from the bombing and there's fires everywhere. It was about 15 kilometres or something like that out to Changi, but it seemed like days to get there. Prisoners were hearing frightening stories. As Japanese troops had entered Singapore, some had gone on a frenzy of butchery. Doctors and even patients had been bayoneted at Alexandra Hospital. If any prisoners were still confused about the Japanese attitude toward those under their control, they would soon be made to understand. To make certain that the prisoners knew that they were serious, the Japanese took out four prisoners, two, Jap two Australian, two British, on pretty well trumped up charges. And they shot them in cold blood in front of their officers and in front of a padre. Fred Seeker witnessed a similar demonstration on Java. He would later illustrate the incident. On a little race ground, there were three poles and each pole, to each pole, was tied a Dutch sailor, stripped to the waist. And the Japanese officer explained that these three chaps had tried to escape. Opposite each of the chaps, a Japanese soldier arrived with a fixed bayonet, and on command of the officer, these three men were stabbed in the throat, in the chest, and in the stomach. Many things happen, but there are certain items the brain does not allow you to forget, and this is one of them. But the most shocking news was yet to come for the prisoners. Soon after the capture of Singapore, the Japanese began a program to exterminate Chinese residents they viewed as either pro-British or communist. The first we knew of atrocities was when people from our own prison camp at Changi were sent out to bury the bodies of Chinese who had been brought down to the beaches at Changi and had there been massacred. There were a large number of them. The Japanese used to bring the, the Chinese up in the trucks and we used to listen to the machine guns going off and the trucks used to come back empty. And we knew what was happening. Altogether, well over 20,000 Chinese were shot, bayoneted, and decapitated in Singapore. The Japanese were amazed that such an incredible number of soldiers could have surrendered. To them, the prisoners had disgraced themselves and were deserving of only contempt. At Changi Jail, life for the POWs went from bad to worse. Changi had been built to house 1,500 men. Now it contained 15,000. 
Once the rations the prisoners had brought with them ran out, there was little to eat but rice. We were running short of simple things like salt. And so we had parties going down to the sea with lint and wringing them out and laying them out in the sun so that we could scrape the salt off. Food was very scarce. Medical supplies were very scarce. Epidemics started very, very quickly. And, of course, there was also this lack of morale. There was a great sense of inertia, the shock of defeat. And it was very difficult to rally people at first. Malnutrition led quickly to disease. Dysentery broke out. And with limited sanitation, it was difficult to control. But for all their problems, the prisoners could not know that worse lay ahead. For tens of thousands of prisoners of war, their fate was being decided to the north in Burma. Japanese land forces had attacked Burma in January of 1942. The objective was the rice, oil and tungsten which Burma offered. But equally as important to the Japanese was the chance to shut the only remaining supply route available to China, the Burma Road. British commanders in Burma once again underestimated their attackers and the Japanese quickly subdued the country. But with victory came a different problem for the Japanese, how to resupply its army. It was a 2,000 mile journey from Bangkok around the Malay Peninsula to Rangoon. And on that journey, of course, they were increasingly menaced by American submarines and the merchant marine was becoming smaller and smaller all the time. If they could find some means of connecting Rangoon and Bangkok by land, they would save that sea journey. Earlier in the century, British engineers had surveyed a route which might connect Bangkok and Rangoon by rail. However, the British concluded that route was filled with too many obstacles and abandoned the idea. But in their initial three months' assault on Burma, the Japanese had lost 67 ships to Allied submarines. A railway from Thailand would eliminate having to resupply by sea. The Japanese army commanders away had to be found to do what the British had rejected as too difficult. Japan had no heavy equipment or train construction crews available to build such a physically demanding project. But what it did have were skilled engineers and an abundance of captive labor. The Japanese broke the news to their prisoners by telling them that they were to be moved to more pleasant new surroundings. For the miserable inhabitants of Changi, the news was most welcome. They told us that we were going to be moved to a place up north country, north, north and northern Malaya, where food would be plentiful and the accommodation would be first class for us and that we'd be looking forward to going there. Uh, so, you know, everybody was putting their hands together, clapping, saying, yes, marvellous, fantastic. They weren't told where they were going and groups of them were ordered to go to Singapore railway station. All the prisoners' good hopes were dashed once they arrived at the station. They were herded into sweltering metal cars normally used for rice and cattle. Those suffering from dysentery had the hardest time. There wasn't room, in fact, to lie down, so we took it in shifts. Uh, we were four days um, without any um, latrines and only casual stops for a watery rice stew. The five nights and five days we stopped once a day. If the train was moving, you and somebody wanted to go to the toilet, you just held them out the door. End of story. They died on the train on the way because the dysentery and malaria was rife on that trip. The trip north may have been even worse for other prisoners who were crowded aboard Japanese vessels, which came to be called hell ships. The health ships were almost indescribable. They packed thousands of POWs down into the holes of these ships, shoulder to shoulder, and locked us down there for days without any water or bathroom facilities, nothing. It was just a horrible, horrible experience. Many of the ships were bombed by Allied planes who had no idea they were packed with prisoners. 
It has been estimated that over 22,000 prisoners died when air and submarine attacks sunk these hell ships as they headed for Burma and other parts of the Pacific. It, one wonders you know, how humans can really endure it. You know, that was a period where I began to realize that the mind is a wondrous thing because you deal with the, these situations you, you didn't even know about before. It was well that prisoners were possessed of such willpower. For the misery the men endured on the trains and hell ships was only the beginning. By early 1942, Japan had pulled off an amazing succession of easy victories. Its forces had captured a quarter of a million prisoners, and the empire stretched from Manchuria to New Guinea, from the Indian border to Polynesia all thanks to the determined single-mindedness of her fighters. The military would need all of its determination if it was going to build a 250-mile railway through the jungles of Burma and Thailand. It would be an enormous undertaking. They were attempting to build a railroad requiring great technical skill through what has been called the most inhospitable country in the world. What made this project so daunting was that the Japanese were going to attempt it without any of the normal engineering resources associated with such a venture. The railway itself was not particularly long, but the idea of attempting to build such a railroad in those conditions was a horrendous prospect. This railway would require hundreds of bridges to cross the many streams and rivers which flowed through the area. Supply would be dependent on these rivers, since the dense jungle was completely without roads. Weather through much of the year was witheringly hot. And for six months the area was drenched by a monsoon which dropped hundreds of inches of rain. Bridges would have to cross rivers which could rise 12 feet in a single day. As if these obstacles weren't enough, this remote area of Southeast Asia is home to a plethora of virulent diseases. Japanese engineers were already pondering a route for the railway in early 1942. By June of that year, a decision had been made. The existing Malayan and Thai railways already met near Nong Pladuk. From here, the new line would move northwest cross the Maiklong River and follow its tributary, the Kwai Noi, up through the heavily forested mountains towards Burma. Simultaneously, a new line would move south from the existing Burmese railway, and the two ends would meet south of the border. The total distance would be approximately 250 miles. Once the route had been decided on, an organization had to be created to undertake the enormous job. There were two separate Japanese forces involved in managing the project. First and most important were the engineers who were in charge of the technical aspects of the, of the project. And then there was the management force for the prisoners themselves, the POW guard force. The engineers were, for the most part, officers from existing railway regiments attached to the army. They were excited by their new assignment. Sugano Rinichi was a young engineer and was impressed with his superior's ambitious plan. I didn't know all of the details for the railway, but I thought, my, this is going to be something incredible we are about to undertake. Can they really do this? The first prisoners from Changi arrived to begin work in Thailand in late June of 1942. Other units were right behind them. The prisoners' arrival soon put an end to Japanese promises of comfortable new camps. When we got to Bang Pong, that was the railhead there, we immediately said, where's this new camp of ours? And the Japs laughed their heads off and said, we don't know what they told you in Singapore, but now you're up here, you're going to work on the railway. We were addressed by a Japanese colonel named Nagatomo, and he made a speech in which he told us that we were the rabble of a lost army, that Japan needed this railroad for her military use, 
and that they intended to build it over the white man's body. Prisoners were also reminded that anyone attempting to escape would be executed immediately. When the main body of British troops arrived, the conditions were so bad that people just stared in disbelief. Overcrowded huts, the stench of the lavatories and the stench of rotting food was absolutely overpowering. In most areas, the men found no facilities or accommodations at all. The POWs were simply told that they were to have the honor of building a railway for the emperor. They were given a few hours to clear land to set up rude camps built entirely from materials at hand. Virtually all of the camps were constructed by the prisoners from bamboo. Roofs were made of palm thatch. Beds were simply shells of split bamboo. Reasonable shelter in good weather, but when the monsoon descended, roofs leaked, gusts of rain blew through the open sides and dirt floors became a swamp of mud. Men arrived with little more than one set of clothes. Between the humidity, sweat and rain, these were soon rotting rags. I had a pair of shorts. <laughs> they looked like a pair of shorts, but they were so thick with patches that... Uh, but that's the only garment I had. As the months went by, many men didn't even have shorts. Standard apparel became wooden clogs or bare feet and a simple loincloth known as a g-string or lap-lap. A lap-lap is a long piece of uh, material about a foot wide was attached to a, a tape that you tie around your waist and then you pull the, the trailing or the tail end of it up uh, round through your groin and tuck it in so that it's got a flap in the front for decency. Work on both the Burma and Thai ends of the line quickly evolved into unending days of tedium and fatigue, punctuated with pain and death. Some men broke rock, Others spread out the ties, and still others placed and spiked down the rails. But far and away, the most common job was simply moving dirt. Each man or team had a quota of material set by the engineers. They would assign us so many square meters per day. We learned very quickly, don't finish it all at one time. They would always assign more if you finished it too early. They would never, not to this day, stick to their word on how much dirt that we could move. The technique involved one man of a team filling an old rice bag with the dirt and two men carrying it suspended on a bamboo pole between them. The work went on and on for at least 12 hours each day. Doing such back-breaking work in sweltering heat was bad enough. Doing it on an empty stomach was even harder. In the best of camps, food preparation in the cook huts was usually limited to little beside poor quality rice. Not surprisingly, men could think of little else but food. Conversation usually got around to food. Sex was the last thing on our minds. We just wanted food. And uh, the thing that was reoccurrent in our dreams or thoughts were sugar, salt and oil. And they'd also bring out a kerosene tin of water that had burnt rice in it, and they called that rice coffee. I used to drool over and think it was a cold beer. <laughs> the rice provided to the prisoners was of very poor quality, inferior to that served to the Japanese personnel. Other than the occasional egg, bits of fish, or tainted water buffalo, there was little protein. The inevitable result was that severe malnutrition became progressive. Work was done under the constant attention of guards. All carried stout pieces of bamboo and were only too ready to use them to hit any prisoner they felt wasn't working fast enough. These guards, in direct control of the prisoners, worked for a unit known as the POW Administration. Since the best of Japan's soldiers were busy fighting a war, the men assigned to this POW administration were, unfortunately, selected from second-rate Japanese troops. Although these Japanese guards were usually poor soldiers and abusive or even sadistic towards prisoners, the chief tormentors of the POWs would turn out to be 
the Koreans. Korea was Japan's colony, and young Koreans were forced to accept the privilege of working for their new masters. It was not a voluntary service. They were, the villages were given quotas, so in fact they were, to all intents and purposes, conscripts. Their position was below the Japanese private soldier. The Koreans themselves were treated miserably by the Japanese. They were even forced to take Japanese names. Their resentment of the Japanese was turned on the prisoners. They beat us constantly, but then as we got to be prisoners longer and watched how they were treated by their Japanese superiors, we could understand that, that they were treated like animals. So in, in defense, they went and looked for somebody else to take it out on. A Japanese uh, regular army officer would walk up to a Korean guard and beat the way out of it. So they, in turn, took it out on us. They all were bad. I, I, I never seen a good one. The prisoners being assembled in Thailand and Burma were not the only source of labor the Japanese were to use on the railway. They also turned to thousands of peasants from the captured countries of Southeast Asia and Burma. The war had disrupted local economies. Many Burmese, Javanese, Malays, and many Indian Tamils who had worked the rubber plantations were first enticed by meager pay or extra rice rations. They put advertisement, of course, uh, they promised very high salaries and good food, free accommodation, free transportation. And also the important thing is that they promised a very short term, like a four month. But gradually the news arrived. These laborers did not come back after four months. When villagers refused to volunteer, Japanese simply impressed workers into service. In some villages, the Japanese advertised free movies. When villagers were in the theaters, the doors were locked and the working age men were simply taken away. Upwards of a quarter of a million workers were eventually forced to work on the railway. In spite of all the hardships, the initial months of work on the railway in Thailand were on a section of line that was relatively easy to work on. This was not to last. The first 40 miles of this railway were built across the flat river plains. There were no difficulties no obstacles to be crossed. Then at Tamakan, the Japanese ran into their first major hurdle, the Meiklong River. They knew that at this point, a bridge would have to be built. The building of the Tamakan Bridge would become one of World War II's most famous events. Sadly, it would also become one of its most distorted. Moviegoers from around the world are well acquainted with the image of the structure known as the bridge on the River Kwai. But much about the movie was pure fiction, which has distorted the story of the real bridge. Because of these inaccuracies, surviving POWs almost to a man have hated the movie since it came out in 1958. It just couldn't happen. It just didn't happen. It was a complete fiction. The bridge on the River Kwai film was a damn good thriller, but it never came within shooting distance of the truth. The Tamakan Bridge was nothing. Nothing like that whatsoever. Nothing whatsoever. You didn't see men march with that feistiness in their stride that those British soldiers marched. You didn't see any of that. Not one iota. Of all the movie's inaccuracies, one of the first was the location of the bridge. It was originally built across the Mai Klong River, but the writer liked the sound of the word Kwai, and the name has stuck. The spot of the crossing was known locally as Tamakan, not far out of the small provincial city of Kanchanaburi. The plan called not for one, but two bridges. The first will be a crude wooden span, not completely unlike the bridge in the movie. This wooden bridge will be the quickest to construct, enabling trains to begin getting across the river as soon as possible. But the second, more important bridge will be built of steel and concrete to withstand greater tonnage. 
Perhaps the Japanese also knew it would be very exposed to attack by air. To build this bridge, the Japanese demolished a railway bridge in Java, transported all the steelwork to here, to Kanchanaburi. This bridge would not be a difficult one by modern engineering standards, but when it's built by hand, using almost no mechanical equipment except a few derricks, it is a major, major engineering task. Crude concrete mixers had to be brought to the jungle. Huge steel trusses were lifted into place with only hand-operated block and tackle. But the central plot of the movie revolved around the fact that Japanese engineers weren't up to such demanding tasks and had no choice but to rely on the expertise of British officers to build the bridge. The story by David Lean, the British officers that were were helping the Japanese to design the bridge was, uh, I've always considered a big joke because it didn't happen. The Japanese knew how to build a bridge. By the end of the 19th century, Japanese railway engineers were highly skilled. Railroads connected most major cities and given the topography of Japan, tunnels and bridges were common challenges which were successfully solved. There is no doubt at all that the um, Japanese engineers were well up to the job. They, they were very good. Work began in October of 1942. Both bridges were started simultaneously. Timber for the bridges was floated down river, and men spent day after day in the chilly water struggling to move them into place. The prisoners then pulled ropes attached to heavy pile drivers to pound the timbers into the river bottom. And then the operation started ramming in the pile into the river bed, which consisted of a Japanese soldier standing on the riverside with a megaphone. And he shouted the rhythm at which he considered that we should do it. And the sound was Ichi ni san chi. Ichi ni san chi. One, two, three, four. This worked well enough until the guards came to the number five. The Japanese word for five is go. They confused our men, so when they came to that, a lot of them let go. <laughs> uh, this caused the weight to fly down, and sometimes a rope would catch in a man's leg and haul him aloft. Guards' ruthless treatment of the prisoners worsened as pressure to finish the railway increased. The usual form of punishment was a beating, what the POWs called being bashed or belted. Tom Collins was working on the top platform of the steel bridge when an auger he was using snapped. The auger broke in two. It snapped. Not my fault. The Japanese thought it was my fault. They thought I'd done it deliberately. Along came the engineer... He kicked me, kicked me in the legs, and pushed me and shoved me and belted me and hit me with a bamboo cane. Then he kicked me and I went over the side. The water was running fairly high, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. The plot of the movie Bridge on the River Kwai also portrayed the bridge being destroyed by British and American commandos before it could ever be put to use. Two more facts, which are entirely inaccurate. The steel bridge was not put out of commission until the last year of the war, and not by commandos. Three of the trusses were collapsed by bombs from American B-24. But even this didn't end the railway's usefulness. Even though the steel bridge had been destroyed by June 1945, the railway was still in full operation. The Japanese were able to very rapidly repair the wooden bridge just downstream from here. Right through until the end of the war, this railway line was carrying supplies into and back from Burma. No issue about the movie is more offensive to former POWs who worked there than its portrayal of their commander on the bridge. In the film, he was called Colonel Nicholson. Alec Guinness won an Oscar for his portrayal of Nicholson, a man obsessed with having British soldiers build the best possible bridge for the Japanese. As played by Guinness, this obsession bordered on collaboration. It made for good drama, 
but like so much of the movie, it just had nothing to do with reality. The real-life commander of prisoners at the bridges was Lieutenant Colonel Philip Tuzzi. Tuzzi was not a regular army officer. He had been a successful cotton merchant in Liverpool before the war. But once in uniform, he quickly showed he was a natural leader and aroused great respect from his men. Once on the railway line, Tuzzi decided early to support working on the bridge. But he was no collaborator. He simply wanted to ensure the highest rate of survival for his men. Colonel Tuzzi, every time there was an infringement of Geneva Convention by beatings and things of that kind, would confront the Japanese about it, often to get a beating himself. But he thought this was a way to force them to conform to some minimal extent with the regulations they should have observed. The bridge at Tamakan, the so-called bridge on the River Kwai, was built in the early part of the railway line in Thailand. Roads ran to the site from Bangkok, and the river here was navigable year-round. The camps here were easily resupplied. Food and medicine, though hardly plentiful, were adequate when compared to the camps to be built further up the line. So the men brought out of the remote jungle camps, the base camps around the bridge, were unbelievably good. Working for, out of Tamakan, we used to be fed. We used to, it was only a pint of rice and a bit of vegetable slop or fish slop or, or whatever, but it was there, it was there all the time. Every day you got it. But further up the line at Concreta, I can remember being four or five days without any food coming up the line at all to the camp. This bridge was the first great engineering challenge of the Thailand-Burma Railway. Many more were to come. Some were more demanding. All would cost more lives. But for the men who built this notorious bridge, it was the first stop on a desperate train ride to tragedy. It is known to moviegoers as the bridge on the River Kwai. The famous film of that name depicted the construction of this bridge as being a great ordeal for the prisoners who built it. Work on this, the real bridge, was hard and dangerous. But the POWs would look back on the six months it took to complete this bridge as an easy time compared to what followed. One of the popular myths of the Thailand-Burma Railway was the horrendous death toll building this bridge at Tamakan. In fact, nine men died out of the 3,500 men employed building these two bridges in a period of six months. Men then went into the jungle here to build the railway. Hell was to follow. Some of the things that happened after that should not ever happen to a human being. Leaving the bridge behind, the railway in Thailand moved north towards its meeting with the other end of the line coming south from Burma. Now the railway on both ends left behind the flat, open countryside and headed into thick, virgin jungle. Roads here were little more than a track through the forest. During much of the year, rivers could not be navigated. What few supplies there had been now began to disappear. Food had been little more than rice since the earliest days at Changi, but now men began to slide from malnourishment to starvation. Prisoners soon looked to the jungle for anything edible. Anything that looked like you could eat went right in the pot. Occasionally we come across a python. And uh, the first one that I saw and was involved in, uh, our chaps took it to uh, the local doctor, our, uh, one, of the, one of the RMC men, uh, to see if it was edible. And he said, yes, certainly. And so we ate it. Anything you could find, you gave the cooks, which they put in the stews. That included snakes and rats and uh, lizards and things like that. It's all protein. While the lack of food attacked the body, the endless cruelty of the Japanese was perhaps a greater danger. It attacked the spirit. I did not think that people could be human beings, or they are supposedly human, could ever be so cruel. You couldn't call them animals. Because an animal wouldn't think, even be, do that sort of thing. 
The prisoners were trapped between two levels of supervision. The engineers, who were actually planning and building the railroad, were ruthlessly ambitious and sought to impress Tokyo with their fanatical devotion to completing the railway. On the other side were the guards, who were only too ready to use physical force against the prisoners. The worst of the guards earned names from the prisoners. Dr. Death, the Lizard, or the Undertaker. Slapping or a sharp crack from a bamboo cane or rifle butt was the lightest punishment. If you broke the rules, something worse was in store. Tom Collins forgot to bow to a Korean guard. They tied me up by them fingers. Above my head, I was there about ten hours. And every time the guard, Korean guard, went by, you got kicked or shoved or punched. Sometimes guards would choose to make an example of a prisoner by having him hold a large stone over his head. And the moment you let your arm sag because of the weight, they shoved this bayonet in your shoulder blades. It just it pricked it a little, no blood, nothing serious. And when this happened, when, when, the, when, when the stone went down, they, they laughed. They thought it was extremely funny. Prisoners were powerless in the face of such abuse. Escape wasn't feasible. The vast jungle was a better barrier than barbed wire. And only a few would resist when they could stand it no more. One of our chaps, he had enough, and he went for this chap with an axe. Unfortunately, he didn't get there enough to kill him. And they chained this poor devil, and they just left him there. You could hear him crying at night. He went into hysteria, and he was living his life all over again. And the whole camp was as silent as a grave. It was, it, it was terrible listening to him. We couldn't help him. We couldn't do anything to help him. We couldn't go near him. And so he died. Prisoners would eventually have to move millions of cubic yards of earth by hand, and they would build over 30 feet of bridges each day. In spite of their many incredible hardships, some of the structures these men built were nothing short of amazing. We're standing here at the Great Trestle at Wangpo, the site of the most ambitious engineering task on the Thailand-Burma Railway. At this point, the mountain plunged directly into the waters of the Kwai Noi. So can you imagine half-naked, starving men having to hang from ropes on that cliff to drill and blast a passageway while men were lifting these great timbers from the river 100 feet below to build this trestle 60 feet high, 400 yards long, to overcome this obstacle. Junior officers joined enlisted men in physical labor. The senior officers supervised, organized, and administered the camps. There was a lot to be attended to since the Japanese paid little attention to the details of camp life, sanitation and hygiene food preparation and organizing the medical huts all required administration, especially since there was so little in the way of supplies and equipment. By January of 1943, the war was turning against the Japanese. Their casualties were mounting. 15,000 at Guadalcanal, another 12,000 in New Guinea. The naval war was going even worse. To regain the initiative, the High Command in Tokyo moved to step up the pressure on the British in Burma. Orders were sent to the engineers. The railway would have to be finished months earlier than originally planned. The POW administration just said it was impossible and threw up their hands in horror. But for the railway engineers, this was a very real challenge. The engineers dutifully set out to make Tokyo's orders a reality but it was becoming harder to follow these unrealistic expectations. But of course, as they moved into the more difficult territory, so they were already becoming weaker. And as they were becoming weaker, the schedule was falling further and further behind, so the pace became more and more frantic as the engineers saw their schedule being slowed. In their fractured English, the Japanese and Korean guards had always screamed the words, speedo, speedo, to get the prisoners to work faster. Speedo became the prisoner's name for the next disastrous period of railway construction. 
the solution to their problem of having too many prisoners was to work them to death. And uh, it began to dawn on us then that uh, if we were going to get out at all, we'd be bloody lucky. Uh, because of deaths, uh, you, you'd wake, waken in the morning and find the bloke next to you dead. The Speedo period would soon turn what had been a very bad dream for the prisoners into a nightmare. As the railway moved forward along the Quainoy River, the punishing new schedule was taking its toll. In the spring of 1943, word was sent back to Changi Prison in Singapore to send more prisoners up to the railway. One of the groups sent was a unit of 7,000 Australians and British, designated as F-Force. As before, Japanese told the men they could bring anything they wished. One regimental band brought its grand piano. F-Force arrived in Thailand to the same shocking realisation as previous groups. There would be no band music. Instead, the Japanese told the men of F-Force to start walking. It was to be a walk of over 150 miles. I don't remember a lot about this march because after the second day, it became a, a sort of a nightmare. People were falling out, and we were told with grunts and uh, shouts by the Koreans that anybody who fell out would be shot and, or bayoneted or things like that. They were, in fact, sick men. When they were told to march, the march wasn't a march, it was an ordeal. An ordeal that was to last for 17 days. The road was only a path through the jungle. When the rain started, whole sections washed away. It wasn't a happy time. Marching along there, I've heard in the past that people sang songs. After sort of the first night and the next morning, I don't think anybody had any songs in them. Rest camps along the march were only clearings in the jungle. Men lay in the rain without shelter, getting what little sleep they could before starting again. For those already sick, the march was sheer horror. We marched at night. We did between 15, 15, 20 miles a night, whatever it was. It was a terrible business because we had sick men with us. And we helped each other, everybody helped each other. When men fell, they were beaten. The Japs were absolutely merciless. For some of the sick, the efforts of their comrades weren't enough. As time went on, suddenly at the back, we heard a shot. And we f uh, I understood then that somebody had fallen by the wayside and uh, somebody just shot him. F-Force, at last, struggled into camps along the Burma border. They were to be among the worst camps on the railway. Of the 7,000 men of F-Force who'd started the trip, over 3,000 would never return home. The pace of work under the new Speedo schedule was now pushed to new heights of punishing cruelty. Work until maybe 10 p.m. at night. Crawl back to their camps. 2 a.m., maybe two hours sleep on a bamboo platform to be dragged out again a few hours later, to repeat, to repeat, day after day after day, this same terrible torment. The speedo period coincided with a fresh torment, the monsoon. The rains along this part of the border between Thailand and Burma begin in April and continue almost non-stop for six months. It is some of the heaviest rainfall in the world. We had no idea what a monsoon meant. And it just rained and rained. It didn't, it bucketed it down and it never stopped. Mud everywhere. The incessant rain made work even more difficult. Trying to dig or carry dirt became agony as footing washed away and excavations caved in. The guards became even more short-tempered. You can imagine what working in rain and mud and slush is concerned, and with all this dirt, there was more dirt being washed away than was being put on the on the railway line, and they used to bash us as we went past and all that sort of thing because they had they wanted to get out of the rain too. Starvation worsened. 
Men were trying to survive on a thousand calories a day. This amount of food was barely enough to sustain life. For men performing hard physical labor 14 to 20 hours a day, it was a death sentence. And the labor they were being forced to do was nothing short of astonishing. A group of 5,000 men known as D and H Force would take on one of the most punishing projects on the railway. We're standing here in Hellfire Pass. Huge rock cutting gouged through the mountain by a group of Australians starting here in April 1943. It's about 80 feet deep, 200 yards long. Naked men, starving men, working by hand. We see here the remnants of one of the drill holes, driven through by two men, one holding a drill, one with a seven pound hammer, drive their way down through the solid rock, charge with dynamite, blast the rock out. For five months, work would continue around the clock. At night, bamboo fires and carbide lanterns lit ghastly scenes. Living skeletons scratching at a mountain of stone in the unending, driving rain. Here, hundreds died of sickness and exhaustion. Sixty-nine men were beaten to death. No single place better symbolises the drive, the ambition, the brutality of the Japanese engineers than Hellfire Pass. This was a battlefield as surely as Anzio or Stalingrad. Outside of the Holocaust, it is difficult to imagine a place where human beings were pushed to greater limits of physical and spiritual endurance. There were now 65,000 prisoners of war at work on the railway. Each man struggled to find the strength just to make it hour to hour. So your whole time and your effort, all your mind was, what can I do to stay alive? I, I never did think that I'd never make it. I had two envelopes with me all the time with my lipstick kisses from my wife on the back. I got, used to get those out when she used to boost my arm. Every day uh, when I woke up, I used to say, right, this is another day, and they're not going to get me today. They're not going to get me today. I don't think any of us could have thought that they were, we were absolutely certain of getting through. It was like being on death row for three and a half years, I suppose. But most of the prisoners who survived are unanimous in citing one common element which, almost more than any other, got them through. You had to have a mate or mates. Otherwise, if you were by yourself, you had no hope. If you didn't have a mate, you didn't come home. It was as simple as that. Men instinctively sought out a small group or one special comrade. The prisoners chose to call a mate. Men were constantly sick. To have a mate to take care of you could make the difference. But it was probably most important just to feel close to someone who cared. He was your thicker than blood type of friend. And uh, if he got sick, you uh, nursed him the best way you could. Uh, you got his meals, his meagre meals and things of that nature, and he'd do the same for you. It was ultimate trust in a friend. If you were dying, he would save you. If he was dying, you would save him. A mate kept the guards off you if you couldn't work. A mate helped you change a dressing on a wound, loaned you a pair of shorts, or picked the lice from your scalp. But the loss of a mate could be very hard. He was a great guy. We'd been friends a long time. And uh, it was like, I suppose, losing a wife, really. Uh, losing a member of your family. It is ironic that in the midst of such enormous human cruelty, men could also display such capacity for human caring and compassion. A test of will during the great speed-up in the summer of 1943 had pushed men to the utmost of their limits, 
it had also created many heroes. Perhaps the greatest were the medical personnel. For every British soldier wounded in Burma, 143 of his comrades were lost to sickness and disease. And this in an army which was quite well supplied with food and medicine. It was no wonder then that the POWs working on the Thailand-Burma railway with little food and almost no medicine were endlessly decimated by illness and disease. After almost a year of work on the railway, in that summer of 1943, sickness reached new levels. It was really at the onset of the Speedo that medical problems became unbearably severe. Already the men were severely malnourished, and of course the resistance to all sorts of disease was lowered. The route of the railway was rife with any number of endemic diseases, but now, working at the limits of exhaustion, the prisoners and Asian labourers were even more susceptible. Thirsty men drank from suspect water. Flies crawled on food and covered latrines. Mosquitoes bit tired men forced to stand at attention for long periods. They infested hospitals and huts, which usually lacked any mosquito netting. Although there were plenty of doctors and medical orderlies, they had little equipment. And what medicine they may have been able to bring from Shangi was long gone by the time of the terrible Speedo period. Most men suffered from malaria. The most predominant disabling disease was malaria, of course. Just about everybody had malaria. One of the problems with the malaria, our, our doctors did a fantastic job, but they had very little, if any, uh, medication to assist them. The only known cure for malaria was quinine. And the Japanese had conquered 85% of the world's quinine when they took the East Indies. But in most camps, POWs received little or none of the precious medicine, while Japanese troops at the same sites were taking doses every day. In addition, large amounts of quinine were sold by Japanese medical people on the black market. Even Thai prostitutes were paid in precious quinine. Dysentery had been the earliest affliction to descend on the prisoners, and it was to take more lives on the railway than any other disease. Medical staffs tried to establish preventative hygiene, but given the reality of jungle camps, there was only so much which could be done. The prisoners' miserable diet opened the way for special diseases. Lack of niacin brought on the skin rashes of pellagra, and shortage of vitamin B introduced beriberi, a miserable disease which caused men to swell up with fluid which distended the belly and genitals. I think the beriberi was the worst. When your undercarriage is the size of a football and you, 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 you just can't do nothing. Your eyes and your ears and your face and your body is swollen up. By the time of the Speedo, most men were working without trousers or footwear, constantly scrambling through brush over rocks and handling rough timbers. They were subject to endless nicks and cuts. With proper antiseptics, they would have remained harmless scratches. But for malnourished men in unhygienic conditions, they soon became septic ulcers. John Hamilton was a medical orderly on the railway. These ulcers were the thing we had to deal with more than anything else, I think, as, as medical people. These sores would appear pinpricks at first, then they would grow to a quarter of an inch round, then they would grow to two inches round, then they would be a, 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 for a whole leg, and this could all happen in a period of, oh, two or three days. With startling speed, infection ate through the flesh and tendons until the bone was exposed. It could kill a man in weeks. Simple antibiotics, even a bottle of alcohol, would have stopped the advance, but none of this was available. Screaming men were pinned to their beds as doctors scraped the dead flesh away with the only instruments they had, sharpened soup spoons. Sometimes maggots were put into the wounds to eat the infection. Another treatment was for the prisoners to sit in the river and let the small fish nibble away the deadly, rotting tissue. When we could do no more, the only thing was amputations. 
And this wasn't easy without A, anaesthetics, and B, a saw. We often had to wait for a saw to come back from a working party. Holding a person down to stop them biting you while somebody else held the other leg and the surgeon is dealing with the, with the affected leg, soaring away, and it was surprising how many people survived. April 1943 was a tragic date for thousands of workers on the railway. Like mortals being punished by the gods in a Greek tragedy, the prisoners now faced the arrival of the most feared disease of all. The Burma-Thailand Railway was very near the source of the world's cholera epidemics. Cholera occurs every year in this area. And the very mention of the word causes a frisson to run down any population in which it's mentioned. This is because cholera strikes and kills so quickly. It started first in the camps of the Asian laborers. Monsoon rains probably leached the deadly bacteria from the soil. Poor sanitation did the rest. Within weeks, it had spread to the POW camps. Cholera is intensely contagious in any conditions. Here, rains inundated camps, latrines overflowed, flooding huts and hospitals. In many areas, men had no choice but to walk, even sleep, in the lethal water. The disease quickly induces violent diarrhea, which dehydrates the body in hours. Death can be amazingly rapid. Some men felt the first signs of cholera in the morning and were dead by midnight. Cholera is easily treatable in a hospital, but here, stacks of bodies came so fast they couldn't be buried. At first, I tried burying eight to ten bodies a day, uh, but uh, the monsoon just washed them away. So it was decided to burn the bodies. The first one was my most horrific because I'd never done it before. We'd put this chap on a fire. The contractions there made him sit up, although he was dead. He was a sick creature. And the most frightening thing of all, he suddenly turned around and looked at me. I'll carry that to my grave, that one. I burnt many after that. The Japanese were terrified of the cholera and stayed away from the camps where it raged. They supplied pitifully little help. At one camp, they furnished a half a pint of Lysol and two waterlogged sacks of lime as disinfectant for 2,500 men. Some of the most appalling camps lost 30% of their men to cholera. The camp at Hintok, Thailand, was one of the worst. We're here at Hintok along with Song Kirai, Kin Sai Oak, one of the terrible camps of this railway. Those men from the main camp, who were unfortunate enough to contract cholera, brought down this way into an isolation hut, down here, black mud, pouring rain, leaky, leaky huts, a death hut. In the area just behind the cremation sites, more than 200 men cremated here. Those men who remember Hintock remember it with dread. It was bad in the POW camps, but the camps of the Asian laborers were truly hell. They had no hygiene, no medicine, and no doctors. The dying were simply dragged into the jungle and left. They died by the thousands. And nobody took care of them because no doctors, no friends. So just abandoned and just waiting for death. Some believe over 130,000 of these innocent people died of disease and starvation on the railway. Most were never recovered from the jungle. Through all the disease in the POW camps, the medical staffs were an inspiration. Orderlies often filled the roles of doctors in the smaller camps. They volunteered to perform acts which, in some cases, would yield death for themselves. These were the men who volunteered 
came out of the camps to work in these death houses to carry away the bedpans, to wash these men suffering from cholera, suffering from dysentery. They are the unsung heroes of this railway. Doctors were masters of improvisation. Eating utensils were turned into surgical retractors and scalpels. Bamboo was fashioned into everything from bedpans and hypodermic needles to dental chairs and traction devices. Old sake bottles and gas cans became IV drips. Men who lost limbs to amputation were given new ones made from bamboo lined with the skin of dead water buffaloes. Doctors in most camps were spoken of with awe. Dr. Albert Coates was worshipped by his men as was Dr. Jacob Markowitz, one of the few Canadians on the line. The Americans were forever grateful to the Dutch doctor, Henry Hecking. He had been born and raised in Indonesia by a grandmother who, who was an herbologist, and he knew all the herbs. He was our savior, actually, because our group ended up with the lowest death rate along the line. But no doctor was held in higher esteem by the men he ministered to than the Australian, Edward Dunlop, known to his men as Weary. Weary was a hero, almost a god to his men. Not only was he a very wonderful medical officer, creating techniques, creating equipment out of nothing, he stood up to the terrible demands of the Japanese who were forcing sick men from the hospital beds to work on this railway. Weary would intercede. He would get his men back into the hospitals and would then suffer the beatings by the Japanese. The Japanese had little patience for the sick. Unless they could see blood, they judged suffering men as little better than malingerers. Each day, manpower quotas were set by the engineers and the guards were expected to produce the men. When not enough men were available, they headed for the sick huts. POWs with raging malarial fevers or gaping tropical ulcers were ordered to report for work. The doctors and orderlies always interceded. Often, their efforts were successful, but out of rage or frustration, the guards would usually beat the medical men who argued on behalf of the sick. The orderly always and always received a bashing, sometimes merciless, depending on who the Japanese was. These men, ordinary chaps in normal life, knew that every morning, as sure as the sun rises, they would be beaten up. They knew. Day after day, the cycle continued on the Thailand-Burma railway. Slowly, small plots, carefully cleared in the jungle, filled with thousands of bodies, ordinary men trapped in this extraordinary experience of cruelty and death. They could not know that Allied victory was approaching and that their suffering would eventually end. By the fall of 1943, over a year after work began, prisoners on the Thailand-Burma railway were forced to deal with yet a new torment. The arrival of long-range B-24 Liberator bombers in India allowed British and American crews to begin bombing the railway. The Japanese would not allow the prisoners to mark their huts, so the pilots would not know they were below. Hundreds of prisoners were killed or wounded in the attacks. Parts of the line were damaged, but repairs were continually made, and in spite of the bombing, work progressed. Finally, the two ends of the Thailand-Burma railway met 24 miles south of the Burma border. On the 25th of October 1943, 14 months and thousands of deaths after work began, a ceremony was held to drive the last spike. Senior Japanese officers arrived. A newsreel crew was on hand. The prisoners were given their first new uniforms in almost two years. The two days before, we were issued shorts. I thought, oh, the war's over. We're going home. <laughs> The POWs lined the track and watched as a Japanese lieutenant colonel tried to drive the last bolt into the last tie. 
He tried to put the bolt in, <laughs> and he couldn't put it in. <laughs> it was a joke. One of our boys had to put the bolt in for him, and he'd, he'd done the last knock. The brass got back all on the train. They went off, and we went back to the camp. And then uh, the, the chap, we had a sergeant major that was in charge of us up there. He came around and says, want all them uniforms back. <laughs> they give you a new pair of shorts, a new shirt, a handful of bananas and that as you come into camera view. You went past the camera, you got up to the end out of camera view, they took them all off you. With a swing of a sledgehammer, the railway was finished at last. The POWs, along with their fellow slaves, the Asian labourers, had completed an amazing accomplishment. Japanese records showed that over four million cubic yards of dirt had been moved by hand. The equivalent of a football field nearly 800 yards deep. Working largely naked and barefoot, men had built eight miles of bridges. Their only help had been over 400 elephants. But most of those elephants had ceased to work at the end when their drivers deserted. Many of the POWs from the railway were transferred to other work assignments. Some were put back onto other hell ships and sent to labor on the docks and the coal mines of Japan. And still others worked on roads and airfields in Malaya, Thailand and Indochina. In spite of Allied bombing, the railway continued to function for over a year and a half after its completion. However, it had never been the success the Japanese had hoped. It never met fully Japanese expectations. They originally thought they could transport about 3,000 tons per day on the line. Uh, then they lowered that figure to about 1,000 tons a day. They couldn't even meet that. On February the 13th, 1945, a low-level attack by American B-24s destroyed three of the 11 sections of the span that would be called the bridge on the River Kwai. It is ironic that this railway, built to carry the Japanese army to victory, now brought it back in defeat. On August the 15th, 1945, Emperor Hirohito decided, in his words, to bear the unbearable and surrender. One by one, the POW camps on the railway were told. A nightmare was over at last. Everybody went mad. They sang all, all the old songs and uh, old Lang and that sort of business, went mad. They broke into the, all the Aussies. They raked out a Union Jack from somewhere and, and they pulled the old um, fried egg down and put the Union Jack up. <laughs> the long-awaited moment finally came all along the length of the railway. Allied troops at last walked into the POW camps. The prisoners were free. Soap and hot water. A cup of coffee. The simple joys of being alive had returned. I cannot begin to tell you the feeling of hearing, the, hearing this voice, this English voice. How are you, mate? You, you know, I can't just talk about it. It's something indescribable. And then you began to realize that you're a free man, that you're free, you know? And these bastards, why not, have not been able to kill me off. It is a tremendous feeling, and that the feel that you can say no to anybody, you know, to anyone and anybody. And this, to me, you know, made it all worth. Three and a half years after General Percival endured the ignominy of his defeat, the Japanese army surrendered Singapore. But it would remain in British hands for only a few more years. After the war, 120 Japanese and Koreans from the railway were charged at war crimes trials in Singapore. Infamous Korean guards like Mr. Blood and The Undertaker were among 32 who were hanged. General Yamashita was judged to have known of the atrocities when his men swept into Singapore, was also hanged in the Philippines. But hundreds of other Japanese who were involved in the construction of the railway returned to Japan to continue their lives 
and remember only their accomplishments and none of their cruelty. Today, much of the railway is no longer used and most scenes of tragedy have vanished. The location where so many died of cholera and were burned is now a quiet and peaceful place. The spot where the final spike was driven and the POWs got to wear new clothes for a day now lies submerged beneath a modern reservoir. But about one-fourth of the railway is still in operation. Passengers move over the rails and go about their daily business, giving little thought to the suffering those rails caused. The train still crawls along the Great Wang Po Trestle, built by the prisoners high above the Kuei Noi. Tourists on any given day walk in droves across the bridge made famous by a movie. Few know very much about the bridge. They wouldn't know to look for a spot where the guard knocked Tom Collins off the bridge into the water. Most do not try to imagine where Colonel Toosey had to take so many beatings. For them, this bridge is a celebrity. It's like posing in front of the Eiffel Tower or on the Empire State Building. Japanese tourists often visit the bridge. But most have not been told the true story of the lives that were lost to construct this railway. Well, the Japanese government uh, didn't teach history, especially the history of war to the Japanese people. So there's no development, no discussion. Even Japanese who were on the railway remember only what they wish. It was war. Things happened in war. As far as I'm concerned, I really don't think we did anything wrong. We were just all part of one big system, doing our jobs and doing what we were told to do. During war, some lives have to be sacrificed, and that can be helped. But Nagase Takashi feels differently. He was a sergeant with the Japanese military police near the famous bridge. What he saw changed his feelings forever. All through my bitter experience, I believe that the we Japanese must not forget these uh, cruel things done during the war time. And uh, remember the uh, miserable people who died in the jungle, and we must remember them uh, forever. For so many, victory came too late. Over 13,000 British, Australian, Dutch and American prisoners, over one in four, died building the Japanese their railway. F-Force, who had so struggled on their long march, lost 45% of its number. The men of H-Force, who endured the horror of Hellfire Pass, lost 27%. The POWs returned to cemeteries in Thailand, Burma and Hawaii to look for old friends, old mates. This year I went back and I go to Kanchanabri Cemetery and I walk around those graves and the tears streamed down my face when I'm thinking of all my mates who are there. And when they play the last post, or the ode, there's not a true word there. They shall grow not old, as we that left grow. Because you look at those graves and you picture them as they were then. Old age has come to the young men who survived the railway. They gather at reunions around the world to honour comrades who left them now so long ago. Those who remain find it impossible to forget and very hard to forgive. How do I feel about the Japanese? As far as the ones who actually 
committed the atrocities against us, I still feel that they will never be honorable, honorable people until they openly face what they did and admit it. My Christian religion may allow, may allow me to forgive. May allow me to forgive. But to forget is a complete and utter impossibility. An impossibility for me to forget. A factually flawed Hollywood movie is the limit of many people's understanding of the Thailand-Burma Railway. In the time they have remaining, the surviving prisoners would like to change that. If only before I die, and I can't, at 82, I can't sort of last much longer, but I just want to know that somebody will tell our story as it happened, not just a lot of fiction, you know, the truth about what happened out there. I decided what I could do with the rest of my days while I'm on this earth is try to make people aware of what happened to us. I almost pride myself to be in a position to, to speak for those who have a voice no more. Because they deserve better. For mile after mile, the jungle reclaims the railway that cost so many lives and now goes nowhere. Perhaps nature reminds humankind of the folly of such acts of political and military will. When national ambition rises above the dreams of young men about futures they will never have. Such a reminder may be the best legacy left to us by those who were sacrificed in this place. In April 1945, two months after the steel bridge was bombed, another B-24 destroyed the wooden bridge. The bombardier who actually did the damage was a young Texan named William Henderson. In 1999, he returned as a guest of the Thai government, and he reminded the Thais that he wasn't bombing them, he was bombing the Japanese, and that it was William Henderson who blew up the wooden bridge, not William Holden. 